And it's to celebrate, of course, the 1958 mutual defense agreement between the U.S. and the U.K. And behind me, I think, yes, there is a ribbon. And I have in my hand scissors that actually work. So, so I'm not sure I should give this to Troy or not. But Troy is going to cut the ribbon, and we're going to do that along with Steve Fisher and Peter Sankey. Steve, come forward, and Peter... Okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'm going to start now. Um, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me here today. Uh, it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be here. Thank you for all the great work you do here at the museum, and in particular for hosting this uh, exhibition for us. Um, and thank you all for the support that as a nation you give us all at AWE, which is very much appreciated. Um, what I'd like to do this evening, uh, just for just under half an hour, is talk a little bit about the creation of the Anglo-American Atomic Alliance, uh, which had a temporary start during the Second World War and then was established on a firm and enduring footing in 1958. Um, and it's a story, I think, about how the Brits passed four tests um, and had to convince people in America, all sorts of people, politicians, money men, lawyers, and finally scientists, that it was a good idea to have this enduring relationship. Um, just by way of disclaimer, I should say my speaking notes for this evening have been cleared for an unclassified presentation, but they, um, they are not an official statement from Her Majesty's Government. The opinions you'll hear me express are my own. They're not, uh, they're not those of AWE or King's College London or anybody else. Now, uh, many of you will have been told that the atomic bomb was invented here in America, but that's not actually true. Uh, the atomic bomb was invented in Britain. Specifically, in 1914, uh, the science fiction author H.G. Wells wrote this book, The World Set Free, um, and in doing so, he became the first person to uh, use the term atomic bomb. Let me quote to you. The air cleared in the afternoon 
and then far away to the west, under great banks of steam and dust, the flaming red eruption of the atomic bombs came visible across the waste of water. They showed flat and sullen through the mist, like London sunsets. They sat upon the sea like frayed-out water lilies of flame. Now, the realisation that the atomic bomb... Ooh, what's happening? Um, Ah, there we are. Mr. Frisch and Mr. Piles. Now, the realisation that the atomic bomb was potentially a real workable thing and not just science fiction uh, is often attributed to these two gentlemen, refugee scientists from Europe who were working at Birmingham University in the UK in 1940. Um, The famous Frisch-Piles memorandum led more or less directly to several months' frantic work of the British government's Maud Committee, and the Maud Committee report added decisive momentum to the Manhattan Project over here. Many people in the UK back at home like to think that Britain stood alone to defy the Nazis at this period and the Americans turned up late to that party, but that is absolutely not the case. Uh, We owed our survival in 1940 to President Roosevelt and similar like-minded Uh, friends of the United Kingdom, who at considerable financial and political cost to themselves, supplied us with food and weapons to keep us in the fight. And American help, long before Pearl Harbor, also extended to the most sensitive areas of national endeavour. So Ken Bainbridge, the Harvard physicist who later directed the Trinity Test, and Charles Lauritsen from Caltech, who later worked on detonators at Los Alamos, Both attended Maud Committee meetings in London uh, some time before the United States entered the war. Now, of course, a British writer may have uh, invented the atomic bomb in fiction, but America built it in fact. And by 1943, Britain was falling some way behind the United States. But again, we owe a huge debt to President Roosevelt because here, 75 years ago, at the Quebec Conference in August 1943, he agreed to full and effective collaboration on the atomic uh, project and the pooling of British and American brains and resources. Now, why did President Roosevelt choose to make this first, uh, in the end, short-lived atomic alliance? One explanation, I think, is simply that Churchill asked him to. Roosevelt liked to say yes to people. That's one reason he was such a successful politician for so long. (laughs) Um, And he liked to say yes to Churchill, I think sometimes simply to shut him up. Uh, But also, Churchill made two important concessions. Uh, First, on the atomic project, Britain's post-war commercial exploitation of atomic energy would be at the discretion of the United States president. Um, And this was included because many people in the United States were wary of spending hundreds of millions of taxpayer dollars and providing a free lunch for the Brits. But also, weightier matters um, occupied Roosevelt's and Churchill's attention at Quebec. Above all, the prospects for Operation Overlord, the invasion of Normandy. Um, Now, Churchill didn't lack personal or political courage, but he was very squeamish about Overlord. He didn't want to risk losing millions of men fighting in northern France for the second time in a generation. And his preference was for all sorts of peripheral strategies to wear down the Axis powers. Um, So probably the most important thing that Churchill did here at the uh, Quebec conference was to commit almost unequivocally on the record in front of Roosevelt and the combined chiefs of staff of both countries to mounting Operation Overlord. And privately, he also conceded to Roosevelt that an American general would lead that operation. So with this commitment from Churchill, Roosevelt could afford to be generous in matters of atomic energy. So the gates to Los Alamos were opened, and by the end of the war, around 150 British and British emigre scientists were working on the Manhattan Project at Los Alamos, at Berkeley, uh, and especially at Chalk River in Canada. But, as you all know, in 1946, Congress passed the Atomic Energy Act, sponsored by this gentleman, Connecticut Senator Brian McMahon. The McMahon Act wasn't aimed at the British. It was all about the struggle for control of the atom between civilians and military in the United States and the implications that would have for academic and commercial freedom. But in line with amendments introduced in the House, it also included a provision 
um, that uh, the death penalty could apply to anyone passing atomic secrets to any foreign power. And this had the effect of ending close collaboration with the United Kingdom and Canada. Generosity to wartime allies was not popular in America in 1946. And it's interesting the McMahon Act was passing through Congress at exactly the same time as the controversial loan of three and three quarter billion dollars. That would be about $50 billion in today's money to Britain. Um, and again, Americans were suspicious of the loan in case it was another of those free lunches. So we in the United Kingdom were on our own after McMahon. William Penny, the one member of the mission to Los Alamos who probably knew more about atomic bombs in the round than any other Brit at the time, became chief superintendent of armaments research. And his work culminated in October 1952 with the hurricane atomic test in shallow water off Western Australia. Uh, the device was mounted in the hull of the little frigate HMS Plym, and here you can see Penny and the Task Force Commander Admiral Tallis admiring their handiwork. And at the bottom right is a frame from a high-speed camera which shows the first half millisecond of Britain's atomic age. Um, we're forward of HMS Plym at a safe distance, obviously, and to starboard, and you can just see that little dark triangle there is the bows of HMS Plym, briefly silhouetted against the, uh, the uh, fireball before she's consumed. Now, Britain's independent atomic achievements in the 1950s shouldn't be exaggerated, but they were considerable. Britain also made her own staged thermonuclear warheads and was the first country in the world to feed commercial nuclear energy to the grid. And remember, Britain was still a, an economically ruined and war-torn country in the 1950s. But the Americans were more interested in what were the Russians up to. And on the 4th of October 1957, the world's first artificial satellite, the Sputnik, was launched from the Soviet Union. Now, I talked at the start about Britain's passing four tests along the way to getting the MDA, and Sputnik made the first test, unlocking the political will at the top level to make progress, uh, much, much easier. Because the US was now, technically speaking, vulnerable to ICBM attack, but at a more visceral level, now felt that its technological lead in the Cold War was threatened, and President Eisenhower suddenly felt he needed his friends around him. Britain's ambassador in Washington, Sir Harold Katchier, spotted an opportunity. With luck and judgment, he wrote home, we should be able to turn this in some way to our special advantage. Now, as luck would have it, Admiral Lewis Straws, the chairman of the Atomic Energy Commission, was in London that week, and over dinner on the 9th of October, he discussed the Sputnik with Prime Minister Harold Macmillan. And according to British accounts, all of a sudden, Straws was clearly in favour of using this occasion to bring about increased collaboration on defence between the US and UK. And this would include getting rid of the McMahon Act. So Macmillan was very soon on the plane over to Washington. Macmillan and Eisenhower already got on really well. They'd known each other since the war in North Africa, and Macmillan had made it a central plank of his policy to strengthen the Anglo-American relationship. And at the end of their meeting in October 1957, the two leaders issued a declaration of common purpose, which said, specifically, the President of the United States will request the Congress to amend the Atomic Energy Act as may be necessary and desirable, to permit of close and fruitful collaboration of scientists and engineers of Great Britain, the United States, and other friendly countries. So that was great, um, but that was only the first test. Eisenhower was a second-term Republican president faced with a Democrat majority in both houses of Congress, so implementing the Eisenhower-Macmillan vision was going to be complicated. Admiral Straws and his British counterpart, you see here, uh, the Atomic Energy Authority chairman, Sir Edwin Plowden, were tasked with making specific recommendations. Straws uh, was a rear admiral. He was in the Navy Reserve, but his real career was he was a banker. Uh, he supported the president loyally, but he was very, co very conscious of the commercial concerns of the United States atomic energy industry. Plowden was a city commodity broker and treasury civil servant, and he understood money too. Following their talks, US officials drew up proposals to amend the Atomic Energy Act. And in January 1958, Straws introduced these proposals to the Congressional Joint Committee on Atomic Energy. Now, the congressional hearings meant a real nervous wait for the Brits. Straws had personal and political enemies on the Joint Committee, so his advocacy was no guarantee of success. 
and there could be no direct British involvement in this, their second big test. Uh, and indeed, the ambassador, Katia, had to send a series of letters back to London saying, don't interfere, don't make any suggestions, just let Congress do the thing. Luckily, though, in the positive new atmosphere engendered by the Sputnik, the Joint Committee chose to focus on specific quibbling over details rather than challenging the principle of better collaboration with the United Kingdom. Nuclear submarine propulsion, meanwhile, had been a big subject of ill feeling between Straws and the Joint Committee for a couple of years, but Admiral Rickover, the legendary chief of the Naval Nuclear Propulsion Program in the United States, had been subject to a charm offensive from the British First Sea Lord, Lord Mountbatten. And so Rickover explained to the Joint Committee that overall he was in favour of dealing with the UK. He said, I think they're probably the most reliable outpost in Europe as far as we're concerned, and we're in a sense helping ourselves too. Very perceptive and considerable <laughs> foresight, I think, from Rickover. Beyond the UK, he explained, he was less keen. As you well know, he said, there are strong communist elements in some of those countries. So Rickover suggested a specific deal. Rolls-Royce in the UK would acquire a complete reactor for the British submarine HMS Dreadnought as a commercial deal with the American firm Westinghouse, and Rickover's own staff wouldn't be troubled with any detailed questions or exchanges with the UK. And Mountbatten probably got his nuclear submarine three years sooner as a result. Finally in Congress, concerned a little about nuclear proliferation, um, Congress insisted that the friendly nations mentioned in the revised act would have to have made, quote, substantial progress in their own weapons program before benefiting from American help. And that had the effect of limiting these new exchanges to the UK only, always supposing that British scientists could in due course demonstrate that they'd made substantial progress. So the second test had been passed, and the third test got underway. Once debate moved to the House and Senate floors, the administration felt confident enough to open actual negotiations with the Brits on the MDA itself and its security and technical annexes. It was Plowden and Straws once again who led these negotiations, but William Penny, the old Aston director, was also in Washington. And you can see his marginal comments here on one of the pages of the very first US draft of the MDA that he was given. Britain had three key requirements at this point. They wanted a submarine reactor, they wanted so, to be able to exchange special nuclear materials and nuclear warhead information. But nuclear warheads were not the main subject of negotiation, nothing so glamorous or interesting as that. More negotiating time was spent on patents and intellectual property than anything else. And indeed, one weekend, a Mr. Griffiths, who must have been a ninja patent lawyer from the Ministry of Supply, was flown into Washington at short notice from London. On the 18th of June 1958, Plowden was happy and he wrote to Macmillan to commend the new agreement. But there was still some last minute drama before Britain's third test was passed. Griffiths, this patent expert, was telephoned at home by the Foreign Office duty clerk at 9 p.m. on the 2nd of July 1958 to approve some minor last minute drafting changes. And even on the very last day, the 3rd of July, telegrams on the subject of patents were passing back and forth in the morning from Washington to London. At noon, though, on the 3rd of July, the MDA was signed at the White House by US Secretary of State Foster Dulles and the British Chargé d'Affaires Viscount Hood. Macmillan wrote to Eisenhower, no doubt with some relief, my dear friend, I must tell you how grateful I am for the help you've given us right from the beginning. So three difficult tests had been passed. We had a President to Prime Minister declaration, a revised Atomic Energy Act, a bilateral MDA, but we still hadn't seen any actual nuclear secrets. William Penny and his deputy to William Cook now planned a trip to Washington for talks on implementation of the brand newly signed MDA. When Penny saw the list of likely US attendees for these talks, he said, I can't see this team straining at the leash to help us. He'd realised he would have to impress a whole new set of Americans, including Willard Libby, who'd just taken over from straws at the Atomic Energy Commission, and the heads of the three weapon labs, Norris Bradbury for Los Alamos, Jim McRae for Sandia, and Edward Teller for Livermore. In the event, though, these August meetings went really well. Some actual US nuclear secrets were now provided on the size, 
yield of some stockpile weapons. Written information from the British side was supplemented verbally as the talks went on, and US confidence in that substantial progress of the British increased. Penny and Cook were able to signal home on the 28th of August. We regard our mission as entirely successful. And on the 1st of September in London, Prime Minister Harold Macmillan personally debriefed and thanked them in Downing Street. That's how significant the MDA uh, implementation negotiations were. Britain's fourth and final test now followed. A first proper scientist-to-scientist -scientist meeting was set away from the politicians at the Sandia Lab in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Ground rules for this meeting had been set in Washington. The Brits could get told about warheads the Americans thought were relevant to requirements the Brits had specifically stated in advance, and a small party at AWRE prepared papers for the meeting. The UK party for this meeting in San Diego, he headed by Sir William Cook, who you see in the middle there, looking perhaps a little overdressed for September in New Mexico, was a talented one. Uh, some went on to great things elsewhere. Cook and AWRE's Chief of Nuclear Research, Sam, later Sir Sam Curran, both became Fellows of the Royal Society. Curran and his deputy, Ken Allen, both went on to university chairs. Others, like the explosives expert uh, Cecil Bean and electronics engineer John Challens, spent their entire lives in nuclear weapons work. The meeting began on the 15th of September uh, 1958 with presentations and discussions on specific US and UK warhead designs. These lasted for the best part of two days, and then there were breakout groups formed to discuss high explosives, physics theory, electrical and mechanical components. On Thursday the 18th of September, the visitors were shown the sites of Los Alamos before the breakout groups wrapped up and uh, the meeting ended on the Friday. Frustratingly for me as a historian, the British participants in that meeting, um, now long deceased, made copious technical notes and the reports they produced back at home were literally an inch thick. Um, but they left almost no personal recollections of what must have been a real exciting meeting for them. Um, and indeed, there wasn't even a British comment on the weather, which I'm guessing must have been pretty hot. Um, although the embassy had signalled in advance, uh, belt and braces, uh, the party should be prepared with light suiting plus rainwear. So what is clear is the British party were pleased and proud of what they achieved at that meeting. Uh, Sir William Cook summarised progress. American scientists, perhaps especially Edward Teller, had been interested and impressed by what they'd heard and were keen to continue the conversations. The British team's mastery of its subject had encouraged the Americans to interpret their instructions in a way that opened up rather than closing down the conversations. So Britain's fourth and final test had been passed. And 60 more years of collaboration and hopefully much more followed. This relationship wouldn't be a joint programme as the wartime Manhattan Project had been with British scientists moving en masse to North America, and it wouldn't be a free-for-all. Information flows were limited to areas where Britain could make a contribution or at least state a firm military requirement, but those were not unreasonable conditions, and British scientists and politicians quickly came to cherish this close atomic relationship, as they still do. Of the three original objectives, two were secure, nuclear warhead design information and a submarine reactor, and the third, access to special nuclear materials, was achieved the following year. Um, before closing, I just want to offer a final personal reflection on the events of 1958. At a very human level, even in the online world of the 21st century, personal contact is important. Transatlantic travel and communications were not easy in 1958. It took the best part of three days to get anywhere in the United States outside the big cities of the eastern seaboard. But to get to the MDA, passing all of their tests at political and economic and legal and scientific level, it took personal contacts again and again. Eisenhower and Macmillan, Rickover and Mountbatten, Straws and Plowden, and at that Sandia meeting in September 1958, all showed it was good to talk. Nuclear weapons are probably the most serious business our two governments are engaged in, and security and commercial interests coupled with this seriousness could easily lead to a closed and secretive little nuclear world. But I think we need to open our minds to a diversity of ideas and perspectives. We don't talk much to our enemies about nuclear weapons, but we can talk to our friends. Like Roosevelt and Churchill 75 years ago, and Eisenhower and Macmillan 60 years ago, we do need our friends around us. 
Um, I hope it's been good to talk again today. I hope you've enjoyed my little history of the creation of the MDA, and I hope we all continue to talk, especially about the past, into the future. Um, and I particularly wish the uh, uh, good ladies and gentlemen running the museum here uh, every success in continuing to do so. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for your attention. So it's, it's 7 p.m. and I understand your president is in town and he's due to talk right after me. <laughs>
uh, table, it is Pampas. Um, so the names of the UK underground tests are here. Uh, a little bit of history lesson. The UK did 24 underground tests between 1962 and 1991 here in Nevada. Pampas was the very first test in March of 1962. Bristol was the last test in November of 1991. Ice cap, where my friend Peter Sankey, where did he go? Peter is there, sitting at the ice cap table. That would have been the Brits 25th underground test, but it got canceled. And I'm sure you're gonna hear a lot about ice cap tonight. So thank you for joining us. Some of you have traveled quite far to be here and we appreciate you coming for this, uh, for this occasion. It seems like the, uh, I don't know how quickly 10 years have passed. It seems like we just celebrated the 19, the 50 year anniversary of this agreement. Now we're at 60 years and Lord only knows, I don't wanna see the 60th, 60 or 70 years go by as fast. So when the exhibit, the exhibit will officially open tomorrow to the public and it's just another testament to the enduring partnership between the US and the UK. Uh, I wanna acknowledge a few people, Steve Fisher, and just wave your hand, Steve, so people know where you are. Steve is head of AWE's International Liaison Office, but Steve, as in, 19, in 2008, 10 years ago, and this year, uh, paid a lot, spent a lot of time in getting the exhibit here and worrying about the logistics and, and making sure everything was gonna go okay. In fact, the exhibit downstairs, I believe, came from Los Alamos, is that right? So thank you, Steve, and thank your team for the assembly work. I would like to, I'd also like to thank Dr. Richard Moore, and Richard, wave your hand wherever you are. There you are right there. Richard, thank you for a great speech downstairs. That kind of kicked off this uh, MDA in, in a good setting. We have a few other guests joining us from the UK side. Peter Sankey, who I just mentioned. Peter is the, uh, the senior technical advisor for AWE. He's here, obviously, and will be speaking to you following the dinner. I'm sure you'll hear about ice cap. We are also honored to have David Holder and Linda Munchen. They are both with the uh, British Embassy in Washington, DC. Just wave your hand so they know where you are. There you go. Robin Pittman is here, my old friend. Uh, Robin is gonna get up, that's great. Uh, <laughs> Robin is the technical advisor for the MOD, the Ministry of Defense, and he's here with Gary George. Gary, Gary, Gary is the, uh, hold on, Gary, I'll be right with you in a minute. He's the senior technical advisor for the AWE. Um, I remember Robin Pittman was here during the Krakatau subcritical experiment that we did in UNA in 2006, and Robin realized then that the, the new generation at the MOD really needed to come out here to see where their monies were being spent, or where AWE was spending their, their money, and to see the complexity of the underground tests, how we used to do it, the complexity of the subcritical experiments. And so we had a rash of uh, UK folks visit UNA. I thought it was great, and thank you for the doing that, Robin, and, and I suppose you, this new generation is there, ought to be c coming out to also look at what's going on with, at UNA in particular. The dinner tonight has been uh, made possible by the uh, generous sponsorship by Jacobs and Valerie Roberts, right here at the table, Valerie. Uh, she is Senior Vice President of Global Growth Strategy for Jacobs. Um, a little bit about Jacobs. The Jacobs Aerospace, Techno Aerospace Technology Environmental and Nuclear Teams deliver technologically advanced, tailored, mission-oriented solutions to a variety of clients who face some of the most complex and high-consequence challenges in the world today. Mostly, most importantly for us tonight, Jacobs is a partner in the current NNSS contractor and that is Mission Support and Test Services, otherwise known as MSTS, and we're thrilled now to have them a, as a museum partner. Honeywell is also a partner in MSTS, and we're thrilled to have DJ Johnson. DJ is Vice President and General Manager for Honeywell Government Solutions, and um, thank you for being here, DJ. 
Mark Martinez is here. Mark is the president of MSTS, again, Mission Support and Test Services, and is a member of our board. And John Benner is here, vice president. John is uh, also a member of our, of our board. We had a great tour, guys, yesterday with the UK at the test site. We want to thank you for arranging that. Uh, we're also honored to have some important guests from NNSA here with us, uh, Kevin Winston. Kevin, Kevin is the uh, JAG chief, which stands for Joint Atomic uh, Information Exchange Group uh, in DC. Thanks, Kevin, for coming. Is Laura hit? Laura's not here tonight, okay. Um, Darren Morgan is here. Darren is the Director of Public Affairs and he's an ex officio member of our board. As I look around the room, John Brown is here. John is the, uh, was the former director of Los Alamos National Laboratory. And believe it or not, he's six, sitting next to Tom Hunter, who was the president of Sandia at one time. And both of board members, boy, our board has really changed and that's, and that's great. Nelson Cochran, who introduced me, and Linda Smith. Uh, they are somewhere over there, okay. Nelson and, and Linda, uh, you know, we have a Nevada Test Site Historical Foundation that oversees the operation of the museum. And these two work really tirelessly to make sure that the foundation stays on the forefront and the museum stays on the forefront. I want to thank you for that. And of course, we have uh, my favorite friend, Troy Wade, sitting right here. Troy Wade, as you know, used to be the Assistant Secretary of Defense Programs. Troy is our Chair Emeritus. Believe it or not, without Troy, this museum wouldn't be where it is today. And I'd like, to, like you to give a hand to Troy. And, you know, t uh, tonight's keynote speaker is Ambassador Linton Brooks. Linton is right here. But we have a few other distinguished guests as I look around the room. Don Cook is here. Don Cook. Don was the former Deputy Administrator for Defense Programs for NNSA. He also was the Managing Director and CEO of AWE. Uh, Tom DiAgostino is here. Tom was the former Undersecretary is the former Undersecretary of nuclear, for Nuclear Security for the Administrator uh, and Administrator of NNSA. And is, I think some people know that Tom grew up in Las Vegas, right? And his dad worked for the Atomic Energy Commission. And then we have Ambassador Paul Robinson. Paul, Paul is here. Paul. <laughs> Paul is the former president of Sandia National Laboratories, and Paul was instrumental in having the JVE, Joint Verification Experiment, uh, come to fruition with the, uh, with the Soviets in 1988. <laughs> and way in the background, I hope Michael Hall and his staff. Michael is the executive director of the museum, and that staff has been wear, working tirelessly uh, mm -hmm. on, this, on this event tonight, believe it or not. And I'd like to, like uh, Jordan McGee to Raise your hand, Jordan. Higher. Kathy Powell, higher. Bailey, higher. Okay, very good. And who am I missing? I can't see. And some others that I don't even know their names. <laughs> so, one final thing. Dr. Harry Powell. Some of you know Dr. Harry Powell. Uh, these folks over here on, on my left do. Harry was unable to join us this evening, He's, but he sent along, along a few words to share with you all. Harry was the UK underground test, test director between 1984 and 1994. And so I'm gonna read his words and what he said, and it's, they're kind of appropriate to, to, this, uh, to this agreement. So, when I, when I moved from Rutherford Laboratory to the Atomic Weapons Research Establishment at Aldermaston in 1968, I was dubious that AWE's closed nature might inhibit peer-reviewed research. That doubt was dis dispelled when I found out about the bright light that was the Mutual Defense Agreement of 1958, in particular the Joint Working Groups, otherwise known as JOWOGs. I first worked within JOWOG 5 and found the whole process of US-UK collaborations and exchange of ideas exciting, satisfying, and productive. 
And as my career progressed, I found that the mutual benefits extended into development, production, and operations. It wasn't just the exchanges of technical data. What was equally important were the close relationships between the US and UK staff and families, which developed especially during exchange visits. I noticed this even more in 1984 when I became, when I joined the UGT program as UK test director. Here the UK and US staff worked, lived, and socialized closely for as long as three to four months at the NTS on top of the normal technical visits and exchanges. My first UGT underground test was Kinabito, and my last was to be ICAP, which some of you have seen looking pretty much as we abandoned it, abandoned it nearly 25 years ago, marking the end of underground nuclear testing. And although this year is the 60th anniversary of the mutual defense agreement, I don't see this as an end point. As an outsider, it seems to me that the need for such close collaboration is still there, and I look to, to your celebrating the 70th, 70th, 70th anniversary in 2028. Maybe I'll be in a wheelchair. On that note, I'm reminded that at the 50th anniversary, this was in 2008, we had a photo lineup of, of the test directors present. We left a gap for, for those missing. Sad to say that gap is bigger this year and our ranks are much depleted. In particular, I want to re remember Walt Wolf of Los Alamos who died recently. He was Lanel test director and my mentor on Kinabito and we had stayed in touch. And, I, and to pass on my regards to test directors Ron Cosme, Joe Beeney, Rafi Papazian, and Chuck Costa, who are here tonight. And even more so to those test directors who are unable to attend today. Finally, I was hosted at the 50th anniversary by Don Barlow. Don, raise your hand. Then the ATM head of communications. Co coincidentally, I made contact with Don recently when planning a visit to the UK's Bletchley Park code breaking site where Don is now a head of, op of operations. And it's, not, and it's now much restored and a fascinating place to visit. I thoroughly recommend it. Thank you to whoever is reading this. Thank you, Harry. And to, <laughs> and to, all, and to all enjoy your evening. And to all enjoy your evening. Nelson, I'm done. <laughs> Folks, we're going to move the show along here. I'm going to introduce Steve Fisher here. Steve is head of AWE's International Liaison Office. And Steve, go ahead. Well, sorry to interrupt your, your dinner. Um, it's, my, it's my job this evening to introduce the next speaker, who is uh, Peter, Peter Sankey. Um, I first met Peter in 1997, I think, when he, uh, 1996, when, when he became my boss as head of International Liaison. Um, I've known him for 20, 20 plus years. Uh, we share the same office again. Um, Peter's had a long and distinguished career in, in both uh, AWE, MOD, and also uh, CTBT. He, he did some work uh, in Vienna. Um, so, without further ado, you like to... Peter Cook. Thank you. Right. Uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues and friends, and I really do mean that because I, I never saw the attendance list before I came, and it's great to see so many people that I've, I've known over the years. Um, let me start by saying it's such a great honour and... Uh, pleasure and privilege to join you all on this 60th anniversary of the MDA. A huge thank you to the National Atomic Testing Museum for hosting this event and to AWE for providing the display that, um, that Troy so, um, so opened so well. Uh, as many of you will know, I spent many years of my life in Nevada, both in Las Vegas and at the test site. This is my first apology, referring to it as the test site. I'm afraid old habits die very hard. Uh, secondly, another apology, as my talk will be unashamedly nostalgic. Uh, thanks again to Chuck, to Roffy, 
and to so many other people who made yesterday's visit to the CES site so memorable. Thank you. It was, um, it was particularly poignant for me, as you can well imagine, seeing the ice cap tower, the rack, the trailers, the UK trailers, and the cables snaking across the desert really took me back. So that's the first mention, Chuck, okay? Um, so going back now, following on from our earlier interactions during the Second World War and the Manhattan Project, swiftly glossing over the McMahon era, and Richard has already entertained you with the origins of the MDA. And I particularly liked his amusing little anecdotes. I love the dress code, and I can't remember, was it suits with rainwear, Richard? Something like that. Um, other important collaborative milestones quickly followed. In 59, the first stock take occurred, and many people here will have been at stock takes. Um, and I was honored to be at some with people like Don, Tom, and others. Um, and the Wogs, you heard that mentioned earlier, the joint working groups. These were established in 1959. And both these, in my view, are still fundamental cornerstones of the MDA. Prime Minister Macmillan and President Eisenhower agreed to deepen the Anglo-American nuclear cooperation still further. In return for basing US Polaris missiles at Holy Lock in Scotland, the US would supply Skybolt air-launched ballistic missiles for use with British warheads on RAF uh, uh, aircraft. When Skybolt was cancelled by President Kennedy, Macmillan secured his agreement to supply the Polaris missile system. The Polaris sales agreement in 1963 gave Britain its new generation ballistic missile deterrent. The PSA created and sustained a closer relationship between the US and our Royal Navy, still outstanding today. The US, Soviet Union, UK testing moratorium lasted until 1961, at which point it was agreed the UK would test underground in Nevada. The US completed one last series of atmospheric tests in 1962 using the UK's facilities at Christmas Island. In 63, the UK, US and the Soviet Union signed the Partial Test Ban Treaty. The Threshold Test Ban Treaty between the US and the Soviet Union was signed in 74. Moving ahead, in 1982, Prime Minister Thatcher and President Reagan signed off the PSA as amended for Trident, covering the UK procurement of the Trident II D5 system, still extant today. In return, the US would build a base on the British-owned Diego Garcia, and US cruise missiles would also be based at Greenham Common in Royal Berkshire, England, about five miles from where we live. In 1994, CTBT negotiations reopened at the Conference on Disarmament in Geneva. I was seconded to the UK Foreign and Commonwealth Office for the duration of these negotiations, where I made many good friends, but mostly many American good friends. Now, I was tempted to say, and I have to remember which country I'm in, that any good bits in the treaty and protocol were mine, and others were responsible for the not-so-good bits, but I will refrain from doing that. Now back to underground testing, which I believe played a key part in enhancing our relationship. We've heard from Chuck, the first US UK test, codenamed Pampas, was conducted in March 1962, with 23 others culminating in the Bristol test of November 1991. If one reviews the names given to each of the UK UGTs, and there are, what, seven or ten tables here tonight, there are obvious linkages between groups of code names chosen. For example, one can easily pick out references to smelly cheeses, <laughs> namely Bannon, Quargle, and Colwick. It might be pronounced Colic, but I'll say Colwick because I'm in the US. Ghost towns Darwin, Midland, and Barnwell, 
and birds, cormorant and corsa, to name a few. But I can neither confirm nor deny that a test we carried out in 1974, codenamed Fallon, and we do have a table, Fallon, uh, we, we believe that was named after a pornographic actress of the day. <laughs> but as I say, I can neither confirm nor deny that. Um, our first tests at NTS were conducted in collaboration with Los Alamos. But as we're British, this just wasn't cricket. First reference to cricket. So after a while, we alternated between Los Alamos and Livermore. And Tom Sandir always participated on these, having responsibility for the front end stuff of the firing modules and the zippers. It always amused, so I'll leave Sandir out of it now. It always amused us that both Los Alamos and Livermore referred to the other as Brand X. <laughs> having said that, alternating did have its drawbacks. If Lab A performed a particular task one way, then Lab B would adopt a totally different approach. For example, one big difference facing us was the canister, or was it the rack? Oh yes, they referred to it differently, containing the device under test. Los Alamos used wire rope harnesses to suspend and lower to the bottom of the emplacement hole, whilst Livermore utilized a large diameter drill pipe. Los Alamos used a single canister in which the into which the device under test was incorporated, while Livermore utilized a second canister. You can well imagine how this impacted on the hardware the UK provided. Dry runs to test diagnostic status and signals were addressed differently at each lab's different control point. One lab chose to adopt a policy of positive logic for back monitoring, while the other chose the opposite philosophy. Downhole and trailer park grounding were also significantly different, although I did manage eventually to persuade both labs that the Sankey way of doing things was indeed the best. So I'm very pleased with that. But with whomsoever, and now for a bit of seriousness, with whomsoever we were dealing, there was just the most tremendous UK-US cooperation. And this, of course, included socialising after long hours, because we very, very often found ourselves, our ground zeros were way up on the Mesa, some 60 miles from Mercury. A national game would be chosen for each test, and towards the end of the stay, the AWE and the corresponding lab with which we were working would compete against each other. We never, ever got the hang of softball, though cricket, second one, remained totally impenetrable to our US hosts. Mind you, there are very few Brits who can recollect the 10 ways a batsman can be given out. So there will be a test on that after. Uh, I will never forget my, my very good friend, Bruce Boughton, who was my Joe Wog 29 co-chair. Um, well, I gave him a, a, a wisdom book, and I asked him if he could remember the 10 ways a batsman could be given out. He did learn that. That was very good of him. And the beautiful, shiny red cricket ball, also referred to as the cherry, that I so carefully carried over from the UK was a mangled mess of cork and leather after six deliveries on the baseball diamond at Mercury. <laughs> now, we, we went to the cafeteria yesterday at Mercury, and um, Chuck uh, Roffey could not open the steakhouse for us. We were hoping the steakhouse would be open because we designed many a Pinex line of sight while we were actually having a meal in, in the steakhouse. We normally fired in late autumn, so our hosts generously supplied a Thanksgiving dinner, whilst we returned the favour with Christmas pudding and custard. My third apology is to my long-suffering wife, Alex, as I was invariably away for our wedding anniversary. Mind you, we were allowed a five-minute phone call home each week, so we're very grateful to that. But I also must apologize to AWE's radio chemists, as they normally had to work over Christmas to analyze the drill back rad chem, chem samples. UK policy dictated 
that carrying out a UK underground test at NTS was secret until the tests had been fired. Now that sounds very sensible. But this policy was somewhat undermined when the UK staff arriving in Vegas after a long flight or flights, uh, we were habitually flown on different routes so we didn't all perish if there was a flight accident. So we'd go over to the Somerset Bar, which was just across from the infamous Somerset House Motel, with its advertised Olympic-size swimming pool, which in reality might have been Olympic-size for Lilliputians. So we'd go over there for sustenance, remember it was secret, to be greeted by the locals with, the Limeys are here to let off another expletive nuke. So, day, a day later, we'd go up to the test site and we'd have those horrible white test site cars with the site radios. And of course, then there would be British accents on the radio, so that was another giveaway. And then we'd play this game. So, the first day, we, would, we called it the word for the day. So, the first day, I or someone like me would get on the, on the net and say, the word for today is aluminium. <laughs> I'll, leave, I'll leave the US version of that to you. They would come back with something like laboratory. So we would correct them on that. And then we had, we had a couple of very strange herbs or herbs called oregano and basil. Now, we, we struggled with those for a long time, but we know what they are. And of course, you will all remember those who worked at the test site, we had to have cap badges. We have to have t-shirts with, with logos on. But what was, again, back to the security part, if you look carefully at Duchess, and I don't know whether we've got a Duchess table, there was a little, mu oh, we have. There was a little music stanza at the top of the um, cap badge. And that actually was God Save the Queen. Uh, Roseanne, and I know we've got a Roseanne, that the music stands are on the top of that was green sleeves that Henry VIII penned all those years ago. Um, the Bristol logo featured a picture of Isambard Kingdom Brunel and the Clifton Suspension Bridge. And Barnwell showed a typical British castle. So that there wasn't a castle at Barnwell, but so, so we, we gave it away in many, many ways. So again, on a serious note, preparation in designing the devices for tests was always thorough and painstaking, involving numerical calculations and non-nuclear experiments to achieve safety and performance detail for the advice. By the end of the 70s, the UK had developed a strong laboratory, laboratory, laboratory based component to the design and validation of UK warheads as a vital adjunct to the limited program of UK underground tests. This included hydrodynamics, the use of lasers, and computation modeling following the advent of sufficiently fast computers. The warhead for the WE-177, a freefall bomb that existed in a number of variants, the Polaris and Chevalier submarine launch ballistic missile, and the UK Trident warhead that is deployed in the deployed in the present-day Trident Strategic Deterrent were all developed under this regime, together with technical collaboration with US scientists and engineers and access to UK, US facilities. It's an essential feature of this certification of these warheads, hence the credibility of the present deterrent that the assurance of their safety and performance is firmly referenced to the UGTs carried out at NTS. And we still refer to these UGT results as the crown jewels. Now, I cannot resist just having a little pop at Presidents Bush and Clinton, who respectively initiated and extended the testing moratorium in the 90s. Visiting Ice Cap, as we did yesterday, always brings a tear to my eye, as we were only five weeks away from firing in 93. And I think Greenwater was even closer. Martin White, now sadly no longer with us, but many of you will know, 
told an interesting story related to this. Following the cancellation of ICAP, the UK needed to recover $20 million from the US. After much searching, Martin found a senior clerk in the Federal Reserve, Reserve Bank who was authorized to write 20 checks up to $999,999.99 each. To the best of our knowledge, the remaining 20 cents are still sitting in a Federal Reserve account <laughs> accruing interest. Ron, where's, where's Ron Cosme? Now, I hope this tallies with your version of that story, Ron. In, in contrast, both Gary George and I purport to have sold the rack back to the US for $1. Since cessation of testing, and that was 1991 for the UK, 92 for the US, the certification of safety and performance of an ever-aging stockpile has been provided through a Warhead science program analogous in its aims to the US science-based stock, stockpile stewardship program. The UK continues to visit the test site as part of this program. We've carried out, as we saw and we were reminded of yesterday, subcrits at, oh sorry, I must call them experiments, at U1A. We've carried out the full toss, cricket again, my trademark, experiment of beef, and the threat reduction area is well served through portal monitoring and counter-terrorism -ter blind tests. I believe over many years the UK and the US have demonstrated how two sovereign countries can work together on highly sensitive matters to ensure, ensure best value with full trust. And I dearly hope that this interaction will continue and expand. Finally, I wish to close by observing that testing, or as we discussed yesterday, to be political correct, we must call them experiments, in our business is, is as critical pun intended, today as it was when we started in this over 70 years ago. Of course, today we limit ourselves to non-yield generating experiments, and these, with NTS playing its role, are allowing us to optimize our modern codes. But I'd like to finish by reminding you of what Albert Einstein once said, no amount of experimentation can ever prove me right, a single experiment can prove me wrong. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thanks, Peter. Let me introduce Tom Hunter, former president of Sandia National Laboratory. Thank you, Chuck. Uh, retired lab directors get to do a lot of things that one questions the value of, but tonight I get to uh, introduce someone who needs no introduction. Uh, but let me say uh, just a comment about uh, this agreement. This, uh, this museum is dedicated to history and is dedicated to factual history. And when the history of agreements are written in modern day agreements, uh, this agreement is going to go down as one of the most unique ever recorded. This is not some fancy arm's length agreement where people talk and write papers and exchange things back and forth. This is a roll up your sleeve, get to work, get some results, compare some data agreement that actually works. It also is one in which the amount of shared trust and respect and mutual support that you have between two nations is, in my opinion, unprecedented. So it's a great thing we're celebrating tonight. Let me talk to you a bit about our next speaker. Um, Tom Diagostino has been in this program for as long as most of us remember. Uh, I'll give you a little, just a word about his background. He's a Naval Academy graduate. He served eight years of active duty. He was a project leader for nuclear submarine development and for the tritium reactor, tritium production reactors. He, he came uh, to the uh, DOE uh, slightly before there was an NNSA. And he headed up a group, I forgot the name, Tom, but planning and development or something of that order. But the real, met, the real mission was to bring um, order out of chaos. And Tom brought 
what is today the modern way of doing business in the NNSA by virtue of his effort. Uh, he became the deputy responsible for defense programs. He, uh, in 2007, he was asked to be the administrator, which is the, I forgot the acronym, but it has a dash one on it. It means the head of the institution. And he served from seven, 2007 to 13. If you think about that, that encompasses two presidencies. And that never happens. So here we have Tom, who served under both presidents, admirably and, and dealt with them uh, very effectively. In, he, he, he retired from federal service and joined Fleur, where he is now the uh, group president for federal government operations. In, in the meantime, he rose to the rank of captain in the Naval Reserve, and uh, he, got, he, got, he had two master's degrees. And uh, Tom and I worked together a lot. We appeared before the Congress. They liked Tom. I'm not sure what they thought about me. Um, they, we also talked to people. Uh, we talked to the vice president on one occasion. And all during that, I can tell you, Tom uh, uh, was the example of who you, want, who you would want representing yourself. But in all that time working together, the thing that I draw most closely about Tom is uh, I, I value him as a dear friend and, uh, and, and a colleague. So Tom, we welcome you. Wow, what do you say after that? Uh, thank you, Tom, and to all of you for being here uh, together. This, we are really a family uh, when you think about it. Uh, I want to, my colleague Peter, uh, you did a great job keeping within your scheduled time. So we're all quite impressed with that. Uh, anybody who spent time in Washington, D.C. in a variety of jobs knows that over time, over the years, you'll get called into, hey, would you go to the conference and represent your agency at such and such a dinner? Or will you go to Senator so-and-so's award ceremony? So, you know, they're beautiful, beautiful dinners and great hotels, and you're surrounded by uh, powerful people, supposedly, and you get involved and you realize before too long that there's a certain pattern that goes there, you know, I mean, it's very difficult to have a deep conversation because people are always looking over your shoulder, seeing if there's somebody more important to talk to. I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but it's happened to me many times. Uh, but, you know, the people are typically always on the move. You know, there's a lot of small talk going on. There are no deep conversations uh, when you get groups like that together, and which is, now, there are deep conversations if that person's interested and thinks that you can help them out in their career wherever they're going. And I don't want to be too cynical about it, but, you know, there, there's that a bit of a pattern there. That doesn't exist here in this group at all. Uh, uh, you know, we don't deal in small talk in this group. We deal with serious matters, and we have fun doing it. But the golden rule typically at these Washington types of dinners is, uh, you know, keep it light, keep it clean, uh, don't talk about uh, anything too difficult or challenging, certainly not um, sex, politics, or religion, you know, stay away from that. And uh, so, anyway, that's, you get the message, you get the idea on that. Well, my wife Beth is a pastoral counselor, and some of you, and Tom knows uh, my wife Beth, and uh, she's not a big small talk person. She doesn't want to talk about the weather. She wants to talk about how you're feeling. She wants to know what's on your mind and what you're experiencing and getting into deep subjects. Uh, and in many of times when she has gone with me to some of these events, she tends to usually violate the golden rule and not talking about sex, politics, and religion. And if it's a really great night, she does all three in the same night. <laughs> and so it's kind of interesting. But so when I told her about, hey, well, we've got this, there's an agreement called the Mutual Defense Agreement. We're going to go visit some of our UK colleagues in this event. She was a little quite not sure. Okay, this is not, these aren't Americans. Are they going to act differently? And, uh, you know, are we going to get real or are we going to talk about the weather? Or does she have to bring up her top three subjects? <laughs> so after really what we had is numerous barbecues with Robin and Iris Pittman at their home in Northern Virginia, at multiple Scott Burns night dinners with Will and Sally Jessett, uh, with Time with Martin White, um, and of course Trudy in a few drinking establishments in Washington, D.C., 
Beth could clearly see that these are folks that talk about real things. They relish the idea of talking about a wide variety of interesting topics. And she realized that the relationships that we had, because we wouldn't, it wouldn't just be me, it would be our American colleagues, that we had with our UK colleagues was different. Different, very different. We got into deep topics, not shallow topics. Uh, that our UK colleagues didn't mince words, uh, that they were real and talked about interesting topics and got deep in a wide variety of areas. And she, Beth reminded me, as she always is really my coach in many of these areas, of what's important. That relationships matter. Relationships do matter. You know, all the technical achievements that has been the hallmark of this program, frankly, for so many years are unbelievable, but they're built on the foundation of the relationships of the people. The direct conversations that happen and are important. In other words, we talked about the real stuff, things that matter. And this ability to talk and deal with things that matter and are of grave importance to the security of our nation and without any real exaggeration can have an impact on the, you know, the frankly, the existence, the future existence of mankind, the ability to do this really is the hallmark of the special relationship that we're celebrating today. This relationship obviously is codified in the mutual defense agreement and obviously has been in place for over 60 years now. And in my view, the real foundation of this relationship is the trust that's developed amongst the people that have been safeguarding this relationship ever since it started back in 1958. So, while the agreement itself gives us really the platform to have that discussion, it's the people themselves that provide the trust that make it work. It's the people in the relationship, the people in this room that have done this over so many years, that are people today that are continuing to do that, that make it happen, and that talk about the real stuff, the stuff that matters. Uh, so when I look back on what makes this unique about this program, uh, in addition to the level of trust, it's also about the quality of science. The quality of science, uh, as you've just heard from Peter and you'll, you'll hear from others, and you've talked about yourself and that you know is first rate. It's not a gift from one country to the other in either direction from the Atlantic. It's first rate science that happens as a result of people that trust each other and that challenge each other. This combined with the significance of the work that's happening, the implications of that, make this unique, as Thomas said. And I, for example, I'll give you two quick stories. Uh, I, really, I recall a significant event we had a number of years ago in which the United States was very concerned about some information that, would, that, that it, we felt that if this information got out, and we talked to the UK, our UK colleagues about it, and they agreed that if this information got out, it would change everything in our ability to successfully prosecute and get deal with a nuclear counterterrorism event. It was that serious. At the same time, we picked up some intel that this information uh, could be potentially inadvertently released and was potentially getting ready to be inadvertently released by fill in the blank, and I won't say who, in a certain part of the world. And we knew we couldn't do anything about it. And that's when we, I had a chance to talk to Mark Welland. Here's the, here's the situation we're in, what can you do to help? And because the United Kingdom has different relationships around the world than the United States, they were able to, if you will, put it back in the box. And they did it so skillfully in a way that it didn't essentially tip off this fill in the blank about what they actually had. And so it never got out. And I know this is a lot of code words and fill in the blank and so on and so forth, but it was remarkable to see what the UK was able to do. Um, and uh, to my knowledge, um, it's still in the box, which is great. So there are countless, really countless of examples of this kind of work uh, the, uh, that, that happens. And the significance really of the NDA is clear because it really allows us not only to work on the nuclear weapons stockpile, but it allows us to work across multiple dimensions nuclear emergency response, nuclear counterterrorism, as we just quickly described, nu naval nuclear propulsion, across all of these areas, and be able to respond to real-world events. Uh, many of you may remember the Litvinenko affair, I'll uh, probably get the, uh, 
didn't pronounce the name correctly, but that was in 2006. Peter Sankey was a key element of the group and the team in the UK that responded to the poisoning of a former uh, Soviet uh, individual in living in London who was poisoned with polonium-210, which for many of you know is an alpha emitter. And alphas are, uh, if you ingest them, it's very poisonous. But the other tricky thing with them is, you know, you put a sheet of paper over an alpha contamination, you won't know that it's there. So Peter led the response on that on behalf of the UK government. I know there are many other people, of course, but Peter was the face of it for us in the relationship. And he led that response in a way that uh, was remarkable. Because here was a real life event with contamination across dozens of locations involving hundreds of people uh, uh, that really had a significant impact on, on essentially the psyche in the area. And after it was all over, I deeply recall the meeting room we were in where Peter and the team were briefing his US colleagues on what it took, what this was like to get through this event. And here we had, we'd been doing exercise in the, is in the past, of course, but here was something that really happened. And I, I think it's probably not too much of an overstatement to say that experience helped us take a relook at our protocols on a nuclear emergency response, how to deal with a real world event. And we were able to update things and do things that we hadn't planned or thought of, the implications of what, what this could mean. So it's not a hypothetical exercise, but action on the real stuff, the stuff that matters. I also remember calling uh, for help. Uh, I don't know if I called it, if it was Vernon Gibson or Mark Wellen, who were the CSA at the time. And ultimately, it came back to you, Peter, as well in this case, was a, a ship that was heading for the Straits of Gibraltar, and we thought there was nuclear material on board. I don't know if many of you remember that. And uh, with, to make a long story short, you know, we got significant help from the UK on that. Uh, but you get, the, you get the point. This is a, a relationship where people trust each other, cross the Atlantic to do real things and deal with the items that, frankly, I would say, well, the, the writers and signers of, of, the, uh, of the mutual defense agreement many years ago probably hadn't envisioned it would have implications in the ability to do things it has done. But we know a signed agreement is, more than, is, is nothing really more than words on a piece of paper. Important words nonetheless, but words on a piece of paper. And we know at the end of the day it's all about the peop people. I inherited a tremendous relationship that Ambassador Linton Brooks had established with Sir Keith O'Nines uh, back in 2007, 2008 time frame. And Sir Mark Welland and Vernon Gibson and I picked it up from the relationship that Linton had established at that point and Linton's coaching for me, I was able to call on Mark and Vernon at any time, and I did, to not only deal with the items that address across, across the Atlantic, but able to do it in a way uh, where I needed somebody different to talk to. No offense to my great lab directors, uh, which I got great, good advice from almost all the time, but the reality is sometimes you need a bit of different input, and they provided that as well. And there's nothing more reassuring to know that you can get someone to talk to, somebody independent, somebody knowledgeable, somebody respected, and Keith and, and Mark and Vernon were the right people at the right time for me. So we know it's all about the people, and it's very humbling to be part of this group and with all of you here. Um, and ultimately, we didn't just deal with the technical pieces, and they're great stories of the sporting events after a test uh, or in, out in the desert those are all real and true and significant because they provide the bond. You know, in the Washington arena that I was in, we spent a lot of time together uh, as, with couples, single, what have you. Over the course of the years, Beth and I spent a lot of time with Robin and Iris, with Mark and Trudy, with Will and Sally, with Lindsey Pinfield, Patrick Turner, and the list goes on and on and on. Some of you, Linda Rakow, just was a real pleasure to see you here. What a treat uh, for me after, after many years of working together. Uh, but we're all here together this evening to do this. And I know this group will always talk about the real stuff, the stuff that matters. And I know the people that follow us in these jobs will do the same thing. And I think we're better off for it. 
So thank you very much for your time, and please join me in welcoming John Longenecker, who is going to introduce our next speaker. John. It's my uh, honor to introduce our keynote speaker tonight, Ambassador Linton Brooks. For most of us in this room who have had the pleasure of working with Linton during his almost five decades of service to the nuclear security enterprise, uh, his accomplishments are just amazing in this day and age. Of course, he was uh, administrator of NNSA from 2002 to 2007. And prior to that, he was the uh, uh, chief negotiator for the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the first round. He had senior management positions in arms control uh, defense agency. He was also a member of the staff of the National Security Council and held assignments in both the Navy and uh, DOD. When we look back at uh, you know, Linton's accomplishments, they're very significant programmatically, but the one thing that I think sometimes is overlooked, while he was in NNSA, he had the vision to bring in a lot of young people into the nuclear security enterprise, to hire them, to mentor them, and do some creative things to, to retain them. And in recognition of that, uh, a few years ago, NNSA um, created an award that is the uh, Linton Brooks uh, uh, see, the Special Award for Public Service that's granted uh, annually. And I know you just gave one of those in March, so well done, because you've made sure that all of us who are a few years over 50 years old, there is a future in this industry with uh, succession planning. Now, since Linton left government service, the, his accomplishments are equally incredible. When I look at what he's doing now and his schedule, I get exhausted. So he is an advisor or on the board of six national laboratories. He's uh, active with the National Academy of Science and uh, Defense University. So, Linton, with uh, all of that, thank you for all of your service to our country, and it's my uh, pleasure to welcome you here today. Please join me in welcoming Ambassador Linton Brooks. Linton. So, um, this is a wonderful evening, and it's wonderful for the people. And you've heard that from our first two speakers. And I'm gonna take a slightly broader tone. Think about where we're in. We're in a museum. Museum exhibits celebrate a lot of things. They celebrate history. They celebrate individuals. They celebrate nature. But the exhibit that we cut the ribbon on earlier this evening celebrates a unique 60-year cooperation in the defense of freedom. It tells the story of cooperation between two countries. For four and a half years, I was a senior American official responsible for that partnership. And so it's a tremendous honor to be here with my successor, Tom, and with so many of my former British colleagues so ably represented by Peter. And since I always refer to this institution as Troy's Museum, it is an immense pleasure to be here tonight with Troy Wade, who himself contributed so much to that partnership at what, I don't care what Tom renamed it, I will always call them about the test site. <laughs> So we've heard earlier that transatlantic nuclear cooperation began in World War II. Americans don't realize just how much of the Manhattan Project uh, was British, Canadian, and, and other Europeans, how much of an international scientific effort that was. But it's the Cold War cooperation that is the impetus for this exhibit. Started, as you've heard already, in July of 1958, when 
after one of the Americans' periodic excursions into isolationism, uh, we recognized the importance of our collaboration with the British. Now, nations sign agreements all the time. I've signed several international agreements. I've negotiated international agreements. But this one's different. It's different because both of its depth and its duration, which are unprecedented. Never in human history, listen to those words carefully, never in human history has cooperation been so close for so long in an area that is so important to the survival of a country. Under the Mutual Defense Agreement, we've shared the most sensitive details of nuclear weapons designs, details that continue to be highly restricted in each country. We've conducted joint experiments. We've arranged for American support of major British decisions from the initial development of Polaris to today's cooperation and replacement of British Trident submarines. It is interesting to note, in line with what Tom said about the degree to which this is a two-way street, that the first missile compartment that we will produce in the United States for the replacement uh, to, for the Columbia class, I mean for the uh, Ohio class, ballistic missile submarine will not go on an American submarine. It will go on a British submarine. And that is a measure of how tightly integrated our efforts are. Now, on that July day, when we signed the agreement, everybody's very happy, you've heard that. Uh, but I don't know whether anyone would have predicted that there would be a 50th or a 60th uh, anniversary celebration. And I think relatively few could have seen the danger that would be represented by the Cold War. But there was one man who had actually already seen both. In 1946, at Westminster College in the small Midwestern city of Fulton, Missouri, Winston Churchill, then seven months out of office and assuming his career was over, although he would be subsequently once again prime minister, delivered a very sobering assessment of world affairs. His speech is remembered for the first use of the term Iron Curtain. But it also contains the first high-level use of the term special relationship that I have been able to find. As Churchill described it, the special relationship, quote, requires not only the growing friendship and mutual understanding between our two systems of society, but the continuing of the intimate relationships between our military advisors. Were he giving that speech today, he would have expanded the word military to include the weapons establishment. And an intimate description, as you've already heard, is the perfect description of our nuclear collaboration over the decades. The Iron Curtain's been gone for a quarter of a century. The special relationship is still here. It's endured and it's flourished as a symbol of an alliance between equal nations, equal partners, with a common commitment to international security, to democracy, and to cooperation. In fact, one reason the Iron Curtain may be gone is because of that cooperation. After all, why was it a Cold War? Particularly in the early days of the Cold War, we had a very expansionist adversary. Why? Didn't war break out? Well, we'll never know. I mean, the nature of deterrence is you only know when it fails. You don't know that it works. But I believe that a major reason why the Cold War remained cold was that the American and British nuclear deterrence made global war simply unthinkable. I believe that deterrent was strengthened 
by the fact that there were two separate decision centers of decision making, independent of one another. And I know that the nuclear cooperation embodied in the special relationship helped make both nations stronger. And the end of the Cold War has not reduced this remarkable cooperation. This shouldn't be very surprising. Underlying, under, underneath the changes, there have been a lot of changes since the end of the Cold War, but there are enduring fundamentals. Both the United States and the United Kingdom remain committed to democracy, to human rights, and to the rule of law. Both of them have global interests. Both of them recognize it is sometimes necessary to act far from home to ensure the stability of the international system and the security of their respective countries. As a result, despite the political turbulence of the times, special relationship remains firm. And the nuclear component of that relationship is probably as strong or stronger than it has ever been. And that strong relationship has broad political implications. In the run-up to the 50th anniversary, the Center for Strategic and International Studies published a book on U.S.-British cooperation. It's quite a good book. Um, and as part of that, we did oral interviews with the late Dr. James Schlesinger former Secretary of Defense, first Secretary of Energy, head of the CIA, sort of just a walking cabinet meeting. <laughs> and he noted that the nuclear relationship and the relationship with regard to intelligence exchanges are the twin pillars which support the overall relationship between our two countries. As he usually was, Dr. Schlesinger was right. Even considering the persistence of the special relationship, though, nuclear cooperation has been remarkably impervious to challenge. In the last decade, there have been, there is a cottage industry of writing new nuclear policies. The government has, writes them. Everybody on both sides of the political spectrum writes one completely inconsistent, but they write them. And there are dozens of them. And yet, none of them ever challenge the Anglo-American nuclear cooperation. None of them ever question its wisdom. We just did a nuclear posture review. As I understand it, nuclear posture review took the cooperation completely for granted, assumed that of course it would continue, and even in an administration which is not as robust in its enthusiasm for its international obligations, uh, didn't think that this was even worth studying. Nuclear cooperation, like the special relationship, has become an accepted part of the national security landscape. It's often unnoticed and inevitably unquestioned. Now, one reason why our cooperation is never challenged is that it occurs almost entirely at the technical level, and thus it's insulated from the fluctuations in our, I mean, we talk about the special relationship, but you know, some days it feels specialer than others. Suez was not perhaps the high point of our cooperative relationship. Um, Vietnam was not seen the same way on both sides of the ocean. But the special relationship we have in the nuclear community was unaffected. In the four and a half years I served as administrator, I was a senior official responsible for cooperation. I cannot recall a single instance in which it was necessary for either side to raise an issue at senior levels about the details of cooperation. Actually, that's not true. There was one, the Department of Energy, the gold medal in bureaucracy, was having trouble implementing the agreement that we would give Robin Pittman a badge. <laughs> and I had to intervene on that. But with the exception of that, 
I, it's because the cooperation just works. I think that that technical cooperation is very important. First stock take I went to was in 1980. Uh, I was working for the senior American official, the late James Wade, who was under the structure we had then, the, uh, the senior DOD official involved with the cooperation. And my job was to keep the State Department and the Foreign Office from crashing the meeting. Uh, foreign Office was perfectly happy not to come unless the State Department came and, and the State Department thought they should be there and we were able to explain them that this was a technical meeting. And that's a funny story and didn't seem funny at the time, but it's a funny story, but it is illustrative. It is precisely because we deal with real things. We deal with technical things. We deal with engineering things. We deal with nuclear things that this relationship is, if not completely impervious, pretty close to impervious to the inevitable fluctuations in the day-to-day -day responsibility. Now, I think while this exhibit is about the past, this dinner is about the future. Extensive cooperation with the United Kingdom has become an accepted practice in the United States. It's inconceivable to most people that that cooperation could end altogether. In the same way, the special relationship in some form has become a permanent aspect of security policy. Now, as they say in the stock department, in the stock market, past performance is not a guarantee of future. Uh, but does suggest to me that this decade-long record of success points to similar close cooperation. And why? States make and keep international agreements because it's in their national security interest to do so. As long as the United States and the United Kingdom find it necessary to maintain a nuclear deterrent, they will find close technical cooperation to be in their interest. The closeness of the relationship, like that of the broader strategic partnership, may wax and wane with changes in the international situation, but the basic relationship will remain strong. It's not possible to foresee the special, specific details of that cooperation in coming years, but it is sure as anything can be in international relations that it will be extensive and will continue to be founded on technical candor, shared expertise, mutual respect, and the willingness to have a couple of drinks after work. <laughs> Thus, this exhibit not only recalls past successes, but it points to the future. Now, many people deserve credit for the exhibit, but the real credit goes to the countless men and women, some of them in this room, some of them now departed, some of us scattered throughout our organizations, who for 60 years have worked tirelessly to make their country safer and to nurture and deepen the special relationship. Their spirit permeates this exhibit and it reminds all of us of their enduring accomplishments that have fostered our mutual defense of freedom. British subjects and American citizens alike, including those who have never heard of the 1958 Mutual Defense Agreement, are in their debt, whether they know it or not. Thank you for your attention, and I look forward to having my grandson come and deliver some remarks <laughs> at, the, at the 100th anniversary. <laughs>